Hello, everyone. Uh, well, welcome to Performant APIs with GraphQL and PHP. The slides are available uh, on SlideShare at that bit.ly URL. I also just tweeted the URL if you want to uh, follow along or, or, or look at them later. APIs are important. Um, we all probably have some kind of API uh, in our application. Uh, oftentimes, these talk to our native mobile apps. They talk to web browsers. They might talk to other APIs. They come in all different shapes. Um, they might look something like this. Maybe you have a blog, and you have an API that gives you articles and comments and authors. Um, you might be dealing with this uh, in different ways, building this API in, in different shapes, depending on what your needs are. You might make requests for every single resource, with like a RESTful API. Um, or you might create just one endpoint that gives you all back all your data that you need for a particular application. There are challenges with traditional APIs that we'll talk a little bit about today and that GraphQL tries to address. One is overfetching data, requesting more data than you actually need at a particular endpoint. This can be a challenge if you're limited by bandwidth and you want to be downloading big, um, make, making big requests uh, unnecessarily. There are challenges with underfetching data, requiring multiple round trips to the server. Uh, this can be a problem in latency-sensitive environments. Maybe you have native uh, mobile apps uh, that are uh, in environments where, where latency, where every request has a fixed cost to it. There's also a developer challenge. Uh, I think, with, with traditional APIs, and particularly in larger organizations where you might have front-end and back-end developers or native app developers uh, iterating on endpoints, going back and forth between uh, uh, back-end and front-end developers and uh, changing the API, changing the data shape uh, uh, that is, is necessary for a client. GraphQL offers an alternative architecture for developing efficient, easy-to-understand APIs. It's another option. It's another tool in our toolbox for thinking about how we build APIs and thinking about how we structure our data to our clients. My name is Andrew Rota. I uh, lead our front-end platform teams uh, at a company called Wayfair in Boston. Um, so I'm excited to be here in Amsterdam. Um, I'm Andrew Rota on Twitter if you want to follow me there. Um, we're going to talk about GraphQL and PHP today. So let's start at what is GraphQL. Um, I'm assuming that, that GraphQL might be new to you. You might have heard of GraphQL before, but you likely haven't been uh, building APIs with it. GraphQL is a query language for APIs, um, but it's more than just the language. So that's the QL in GraphQL. Um, but it's, it's also a runtime. Um, it's, a, it's really a technology stack for building APIs, um, for fulfilling those queries with your existing data, um, however that data is accessed uh, within your uh, application. GraphQL queries look something like this. This is a, a simple GraphQL query. Um, I'll be using kind of a loose demo application for this uh, talk today. Um, you can imagine you're requesting PHP conferences and the speakers at those conferences, um, information about those conferences. Uh, so this is what a query looks like. It might look a little bit familiar. Maybe it looks like something, uh, maybe it looks like uh, JSON. And that's because it, it's supposed to. It returns uh, the JSON data in exactly the shape you requested. And so a GraphQL query is essentially just a, a JSON data structure uh, without the content, without the values. And you can request nested values uh, in, within these queries. And this is where GraphQL starts to become a little bit powerful. So if I want to request conferences as well as a sub-resource, speakers, uh, I can go ahead and do that. And again, I get the data exactly uh, in the shape that I requested. I'm going to cover a couple topics today, um, a little bit on an introduction of what GraphQL is, and then dive into uh, what the concepts are in GraphQL. Um, if you're familiar with other APIs, GraphQL is a little bit of a paradigm shift. Um, there are some different concepts, there are some different terms, um, some different definitions, and understanding those uh, will give you a good idea of um, how GraphQL works and allow you to explore it further. We'll talk about client-side GraphQL, um, how you can consume GraphQL APIs. Um, we'll be focusing on JavaScript, but you can do that in any type of client. And we'll talk about GraphQL specifically on the server side with PHP. Uh, I think this is maybe a little bit more interesting. Uh, uh, for this conference, we'll talk a little bit about how to implement GraphQL within, uh, within a PHP application. We'll talk about some advanced topics, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about GraphQL tooling, uh, some of the, the fun part of working with GraphQL. GraphQL was developed internally at Facebook in 2012. Um, they'd used it in production for some time, and it was built to serve some of the needs that they had uh, with, their, with their applications. It was open sourced in 2015, um, so it's been around as an open source uh, uh, technology stack for a while. Um, and it actually has a proper spec, so it can be implemented um, from this spec uh, in various environments. 
GraphQL is technology agnostic, both client and the server. Um, so that means you can use it in different technology stacks. On the client, there are implementations for JavaScript, and multiple implementations for JavaScript, uh, for Swift, um, for Android applications. Um, there are also server-side uh, implementations for GraphQL. Uh, the most common was Node. Uh, so no when Facebook open sourced uh, GraphQL, they created a Node reference server. And so that's kind of the starting point for a lot of GraphQL servers. Um, but there have been subsequent community server implementations for Python, for Ruby, and of course for PHP. And when we think about why GraphQL, um, we think about addressing some of those challenges that I mentioned earlier. With GraphQL, the client requests exactly the shape of the data it needs. Multiple queries can be, multiple resources can be queried in a single request. You can reduce those uh, round trips. Your API is defined with a strongly typed schema. I think this is uh, maybe one of the overlooked advantages of GraphQL, that it's actually a typed API. Um, and it enables strong tooling for developers. Um, we'll take a little bit, uh, we'll take a look at it later on. Um, and certainly some of this tooling is available for other API technologies, but some of the characteristics of GraphQL actually uh, unlock a lot of these possibilities. Where does GraphQL fit in your web stack? Um, just to take a step back and think about where this fits in your system. Uh, so if you have a web application, uh, you're going to have a client um, that might be, that might involve JavaScript, might involve, uh, might be a native application, and that client's going to make requests to the server. Uh, maybe your entire application is an SPA, so you're making a lot of uh, Ajax or fetch requests to the server, um, or maybe you server side render the majority of your content and you're just making occasional Ajax requests to add features uh, to get content back from the server. With GraphQL, those requests would get made through GraphQL queries to a single endpoint uh, living on a server. In this case, we'll talk about a PHP server. And that PHP server would then uh, get the data. Maybe it's just getting it from a database and sends back the response to the client. Uh, but that data store could be anything. It might be another service. It might be a cache layer. Um, GraphQL is not opinionated about what that uh, backend data store is. It allows you to request from, from any um, data persistence layer. This is the architecture we'll be talking a little bit about today, but this isn't the only way you could implement GraphQL. Um, in fact, another possibility um, is that you could have a GraphQL server not in PHP. You could put it in something like Node and have that live uh, in front of, uh, say, a PHP uh, service that's doing the uh, data request to a database or a cache layer or to another service. So there are many kind of options you can think about it, but GraphQL lives in that, that middle kind of API uh, layer. Talk about some of the GraphQL concepts, some of the definitions and terms that uh, make up the GraphQL uh, ecosystem. Start with queries. Essentially, GraphQL is about queries and fields. In GraphQL, you make queries for fields on objects, and the response will have the same shape as the query. So, this entire uh, block of code here is the query. And then the field is going to be uh, conferences, names, or dates. Um, underneath there. Fields might be scalar values, they might be primitives, booleans, strings, numbers, um, or they might be other objects. Um, we talk about making a sub-selection when it's another object, when we're selecting uh, another complex object uh, that's not a primitive. And you can continue to nest these. You can make these sub-selections throughout your query, and that allows you uh, to avoid making those multiple requests uh, for related resources. Queries can have arguments. So you can pass named arguments to each field um, on a nested object. It means that if you want to filter or paginate or sort uh, or search uh, for data, you can pass in arguments uh, and handle those on the server side. Uh, from the client side, you can also use variables. So you can pass in dynamic data here um, and pass those into the arguments that you're using in your query. So those are how you make uh, that's how you make requests, that's how you make queries to the service. On the service side, we have to define uh, in GraphQL the set of types that describe the data uh, that can be requested. And so we do that through schemas. Uh, the code that we see here is actually um, GraphQL schema language, so it's a way to uh, describe GraphQL schemas. Some servers actually use this as a starting point for building up the type system on the server side. Um, some don't, and we'll just generate it as an artifact. But either way, it's how we talk about uh, some of the, uh, it's how we talk about the schema definition in a GraphQL, uh, in a GraphQL graph. And so 
when we have, uh, when we have these, these schemas, we can define the fields on the types of, of the objects that we have in our graph. Types can be objects, uh, which just have other fields. They can be scalars. They can be lists of other uh, types. Uh, they can be enumerable values, uh, et cetera. You can mark something as non-nullable, which is incredibly valuable if on the client side you might not know whether a value might be defined or not. Uh, you can make guarantees in your type system that from the client side you'll know that this value will always be here and if it's not something is very wrong or it won't be here and I need to handle that negative case. I've talked a bit about queries which is um, essentially one of the, the root types. There's another root type called mutations and root types are, are really just special types within, within GraphQL. Queries are for asking for data. They're analogous to get requests. Uh, so we're, we're reading data. It, GraphQL clients make these queries against a single endpoint. Uh, sometimes you'll see queries with the word query. Sometimes you'll actually see named queries, uh, which can be useful uh, for, uh, you know, for logging or for, or for tracking uh, metadata about, about queries being made. Um, but those are optional. You might just see the brackets um, and start the query directly. Uh, mutations are another special type, and they're for modifying data. They're analogous to post requests or put requests, um, whether they're changing something, deleting something, or adding something new. Um, that might seem like something that's fundamentally different, but they actually work quite similarly uh, to queries. They start with the mutation root type. Um, they will likely have arguments because you're changing something or adding something, but otherwise they're the same as queries. So how do we consume these uh, these queries on the client when we, get, when we get the data back? How do we make the queries to our server? Client-side GraphQL is about writing queries to request data uh, from a server with a defined schema. We'll talk about making these from JavaScript. There are several libraries that we can do to make these requests. Uh, we certainly could just make a straight curl request, a straight HTTP request to get our data back. But with GraphQL, because of the, um, some, some of the features that it introduces, having a client library can be helpful here. If you want to start with GraphQL on the client as simple as you can get, I would recommend a library like Loca. It's a dead simple GraphQL client library um, that's really kind of similar to like jQuery.ajax, where you're just making the query directly to your server, and then you have a promise API to uh, handle the data. And you don't have much more than that. Um, there's no caching that happens. There's no magic that happens. It's not doing any client-side state management at all. It's just making a direct uh, query to your, to your service. And this is a great way to get started uh, using GraphQL. There are more complex uh, client libraries. Um, one of them, probably the most popular one, is uh, called Apollo. And that's really a complete data management solution on the client side. Uh, this is an implementation for, uh, for JavaScript, React specifically, uh, but they have implementations for other front-end libraries as well as for native application. And what something like Apollo brings to the table is really taking advantage of all of the features uh, that are unlocked by a GraphQL API. Uh, it supports things like normalized uh, normalized data for client-side caching, the ability to combine remote and local data, so you can actually query all your data even if you're not hitting a server through a GraphQL interface, uh, pagination, error handling, refetching, all the things that um, on one hand might be challenging with, with GraphQL, but also when done with a, uh, when, when handled with, a, uh, with a, a solid client library can actually unlock a lot of possibilities that other APIs um, don't provide out of the box. All right, so that's how we consume GraphQL on the client. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about GraphQL on the server, specifically with PHP. So if client-side GraphQL is about writing queries to request data from the server, server-side GraphQL is about implementing that schema to return data. So let's build a server in PHP. There's an excellent server library um, that I recommend uh, checking out if you're looking to build a GraphQL server in PHP, and that's the WebOnyx GraphQL-PHP library. Uh, this is a feature complete implementation of GraphQL, and it was inspired by the original Node.js reference uh, library, so it has um, some similar patterns to that original implementation. Um, what does this library actually give you? Well, when you're building your API in PHP, you're going to need a few, uh, few features to be able to, to build a GraphQL API properly. Um, one of them is type primitives for your type system. So the library provides uh, those primitives. It also provides the uh, functionality to parse, validate, and execute your queries. It's kind of the heavy lifting of GraphQL. It's actually taking that query and, uh, and then executing it against the, the resolvers that you, you implement. Uh, supports type introspection, which um, unlocks some of the tools that we'll look at later. 
And it also supports features like deferred field resolution, which help you with uh, performance uh, problems that you might run into. So how do you start? Uh, you start with your endpoint. Uh, in GraphQL, you have a single endpoint. Unlike something like REST, where you might have multiple endpoints for different resources, in GraphQL, you usually have a single GraphQL endpoint. It's often called slash GraphQL uh, to handle all your requests, and you'll get your responses from that. Queries are made to the single endpoint, and the, uh, the GraphQL execute query function uh, from the GraphQL PHP library um, provides us a facade function to handle all that uh, parsing, execution, and validation um, that does all the work uh, uh, for translating that query into, uh, into the, the, the resolvers that you'll end up writing. Then we need to start with our, our root type, that's query. There are two root types with a GraphQL query and mutation. Let's start with the first one, uh, query. The root type will have a list of root fields. These are the entry points for API. This might be something like, get me all the conferences uh, for my application. Uh, each field has a type and a resolve method for getting the data. You have a function that tells uh, uh, GraphQL PHP how to get the data for this particular field. But fields uh, don't have to be flat. They can return other objects, so they don't just have to return primitives. And this is how you can start to build up uh, a more complex uh, graph of data. Once you start to set these fields, you need to tell PHP how to uh, get the data for the field. And we do this through resolve functions. This is where you're gonna be writing the logic for accessing your, your data persistence layer. Um, now frequently you won't do that directly in the resolver. You would usually have a layer below that, uh, or maybe multiple layers. Um, that will delegate to a, to a business or domain logic layer, and then eventually to your data access layer. But again, GraphQL doesn't really care what that is, and you have a lot of flexibility in how you implement that. For scalars, the return value will simply be the value of the field. Um, for object types, it will pass through the nested, uh, the nested fields um, by default, and if you want more flexibility, um, you can certainly take advantage of that. Those resolver functions are pretty key. You're gonna have access to a lot within this uh, resolve function. So you start with the result of the previous uh, resolve uh, field. Um, so as your, as your data gets more nested, maybe you want to select speakers on, um, for conferences, and so you'll need to know what conference you're selecting speakers for. Uh, you have those arguments uh, if you're filtering or, or, uh, or otherwise passing in data from the, from the client. You have context, which could be useful for passing through um, static data that's not changing um, in the lifecycle of the request, so you want every field to have access to. Maybe it's authentication, for example. Um, in general, GraphQL recommends, um, GraphQL patterns tend to recommend not doing um, authorization within your resolvers itself and delegating that instead to a business layer where you can do more robust authorization logic. So these, these resolvers um, and build, building up these uh, complex types is really a key piece of building your GraphQL API. So let's create a custom object type. To do that, you're going to start by defining what your object type is, adding it to a new field, and writing that field resolver function. So just like that root query type, a custom type is a collection of fields, and they each have, in turn, their own type as well. Uh, so your conference uh, type might have uh, fields for a name, a URL, and a location. These are going to be strings, um, but I also know that two of those fields are going to be non-null, uh, and so I know, I know that my data is going to guarantee that those are always going to be there, and so I can add that into the type system for my API. Fields can also have other custom object types. So conference might have speakers, which is going to be a list of the speaker custom type, which I've created, and then I can uh, provide a resolver function to tell GraphQL how to uh, get the data for, uh, for that field. And that's it. That's essentially what it takes to build a GraphQL server in PHP. Uh, we have a, a couple of custom types. We have some fields on those types that return uh, scalar values or other lists of custom values. Uh, and the GraphQL PHP server will handle wiring that up and then make those requests to our, our data store on the back end. And if you're interested in digging into this example a little bit more, uh, I gave a workshop on it yesterday, uh, but the slides are available for that. I've linked to them at the end of this, uh, end of this talk. And you can build out a GraphQL API uh, in PHP uh, using this basic application structure. Uh, that last slide, or this picture right here, um, is 
a preview of some of the GraphQL tooling that's available. So I want to go into that because I think it's probably one of the uh, more fun parts about uh, GraphQL. A key feature of GraphQL is its introspection system. You can make a query to GraphQL uh, to ask it about what queries it supports. And so you're generally never making these queries manually. Your application um, probably doesn't care. Um, but tooling cares, developer tooling cares. Um, so you can expose these uh, introspection endpoints, these introspection queries to, um, to the users of your API. Maybe those are just internal developers um, if you don't want to expose them to an external API. Uh, but developers can uh, make requests to see what the shape of your graph looks like. And you're gonna get back a complex object that you don't have to deal with, um, but it's basically just going to tell you the shape of that API and what queries uh, you can make, what types are available. This one feature unlocks a lot of opportunities for building some really powerful tooling. And since GraphQL has been open source, a lot of that tooling has been developed by the community. Uh, the first tool that was uh, released, as far as I know, is a tool called Graphical. Uh, which is uh, what you've likely seen if you've seen a demo um, or you look around for demos of GraphQL. Um, and it's really just a, a basic tool that allows you to make queries, um, to write queries uh, uh, on the side here, and then get the data back uh, from the server in a structured format. Um, but you also get this documentation panel on the far side, which gives you some information about the different fields that you have. Uh, one of the things that you can do in GraphQL is actually for each field set a description. And that will come back in the introspection query, so you can provide some uh, documentation in the code itself uh, describing what each, field, uh, what each field does and how to use it. Uh, there's a tool called GraphQL Playground um, that I showed earlier, and this is a little bit like Graphical, but it has a few more features. Um, one of them is, is actually this ability to look at, uh, look at the schema as well, and I can demo that um, right now. So if I pull up uh, GraphQL Playground uh, for that similar application. I can run a query. I have to spin up my server, there we go. There we go, so I can run the query. Uh, and because it's GraphQL, I can go ahead and change the data. Um, if I wanna get location, I can get that. And I'm gonna get autocomplete for this because again, we're just making that introspection query and so the IDE knows what fields are available to it. Um, and maybe I wanna get speakers and I wanna get their names. Um, and so this is gonna return the data back in the, in the structure I want. I have my documentation available for all of these fields, and so I can dig into, in, dig into that a bit. And I also get that schema notation that I mentioned earlier, uh, just generated from that introspection. So I can see exactly what that schema is, and this can actually be in turn uh, consumed by other tools as well. Um, there's an excellent tool called Voyager, uh, which provides any GraphQL API as an interactive graph. So from that introspection, you can actually see what your graph looks like. Uh, this is really useful, I think, if you're uh, jumping into a new data domain or a new application for the first time. Maybe you've hired a new engineer uh, for your team and they're not familiar with, uh, with your data structures at all um, from, for your API. Um, they have that immediately available to you and you don't have to do much to build this out. So um, this is a really simple uh, API for the, the application, the demo application I mentioned. Um, but I actually wanted to pull up the, uh, this is the GitHub API. There's a GitHub GraphQL API available. And uh, it's a little bit, little bit more complex. Um, so you can actually dig into like, okay, let's go to our root query. You know, we only have, we have a handful of root uh, fields that we can query on. We can go to repository. What does my repository type look like? And I can see um, immediately everything that's, uh, that's available here. There are also IDE plugins. Um, how many here use PHP Storm? One of the JetBrains IDEs. Awesome, yeah. It's uh, uh, one of the cool things with, uh, with the JetBrains IDEs is that there's a, there's a plugin available, the JS GraphQL plugin, uh, for uh, integration with GraphQL, so you can make your queries um, right in your IDE, get your data back, um, and you can get that kind of auto-completion to understand what, what fields are available, what the types are going to be. Um, this is actually one of, one of my favorite features of, of GraphQL and one that I think is underutilized, is because GraphQL is typed, because it's a type API, we can actually generate types uh, to be consumed in our client code as well. Uh, there's a tool called Apollo Code Gen, um, written by, uh, also written by Apollo, and uh, it'll allow you to take that schema uh, that we looked at earlier and actually generate uh, a TypeScript or flow, uh, flow type, which is another uh, JavaScript 
uh, type annotation tool, uh, generate types directly from your schema. Um, you can do this and have it auto-generate as you're writing code in development so that when you're writing JavaScript code in your IDE, you can know whether you're uh, requesting a field, whether it's going to be a string, whether it's a field at all, whether it could be nullable, and maybe you aren't writing a null check to handle the undefined cases. Um, handling those type errors that you might end up, uh, or that you frequently write, uh, end up if you uh, don't uh, have a good understanding of the shape of your data on the server side. So those are the general, um, those are the GraphQL tools. I recommend digging into those a little bit. Actually, if you're exploring GraphQL for the first time, the tools are really a great way to understand how it works, even before building your own server. Um, I think it's an excellent way to understand how everything fits together, whether it's in a particular data domain or in, in just GraphQL in general. Uh, and a lot of those tools are, they're great because they've been built by uh, the community, but I'd say the selling point for GraphQL is not necessarily that the tools exist. I think that's excellent, but the fact that they can exist because of the nature of, of how uh, of some of the features of GraphQL, um, whether it be types or introspection, um, things like that. Uh, so I want to touch on some of more some more advanced features in GraphQL. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, um, but there might be questions uh, in your mind about security or performance, um, and those topics could be a topic for an entirely different talk. Uh, but I want to just briefly uh, touch on them and kind of. Uh, plant some ideas for how we can address some of those issues in, in GraphQL. Uh, so one is um, a problem, it's referred to as the M plus one problem. So in our example, imagine we're, we're selecting conferences and we're selecting all the speakers for those conferences. And we've implemented our resolvers in such a way that whenever we hit the speaker field, we're going to make a uh, uh, request to our, our data layer, which will then make a, a SQL query um, for all of the speakers uh, for a particular conference. Naively implemented, this could be a very inefficient uh, way to access our data. Imagine we have a hundred uh, we have a hundred conferences that we we get back from this query. Uh, we make the the one request for all the conferences, and then we're going to make n uh, SQL queries for every uh, every single set of speakers that we want to uh, we want to request. Um, and this is not an efficient way to request that data. And this is actually a problem that's not unique to GraphQL, something that we run into with ORMs as well. It's, it's something that we, we need to think about whenever we're abstracting over uh, data access. Uh, and GraphQL provides a, a mechanism for, for dealing with this. And so that, that mechanism is called deferred resolvers. The GraphQL PHP library actually provides um, some functionality for this. Um, they provide uh, deferred objects that can delay field resolution until, we've, uh, until we can make a single batch request for, uh, for those deferred fields. So in the case of speaker collection, uh, what I essentially want to do is batch up um, all the speaker IDs that I'm, I'm requesting, um, I'm sorry, all the conference IDs that I'm requesting, uh, return a deferred object, and then I'm going to, uh, once I've resolved all my other fields, I can make a single, um, hopefully more efficient query uh, to request the speakers for multiple conferences. And depending on how your data is implemented, this, you might do this in different ways. Um, but GraphQL provides mechanisms to kind of handle these, these cases. Um, certainly, it takes a little bit more work, and it's something you need to be aware of when working with GraphQL. Uh, GraphQL PHP um, also supports uh, handling deferred field resolution um, with a if you have an environment that supports async operations, and so those fields can, also can resolve asynchronously. Um, you don't get that. Um, with vanilla PHP, but there are certainly um, uh, environments that, that make that possible. If you're exposing uh, a GraphQL uh, server externally or, to, um, or where you don't have a small set of queries that you know you're making an application, you might be concerned about pathological queries, queries that could uh, be very uh, uh, harmful to the performance of your system. Um, Maybe they're malicious, maybe they're not. Maybe it's just uh, a very poorly performing query. Um, we have a couple ways that you can handle this, specifically in the GraphQL PHP library. Um, one of them is that you can actually uh, set a complexity cost um, per field. And you can set, you can set these uh, complexity scores. I mean, uh, when GraphQL is um, resolving the fields uh, from a query, it will calculate up what the sum of the complexity is, and you can set a threshold, and you can say, well, if we've resolved this many fields, I know it's going to be this expensive. I'm just going to uh, stop the query. And you can also uh, set a depth limit, so you can limit the number of nested fields uh, uh, requested in queries. 
these are mitigation measures. Um, they're not perfect, but there are some tools that are, are provided. If you're building an API that's only consumed by your applications, maybe you're building uh, an API for a native app or for a uh, JavaScript web application, you have, uh, you have some more options. And one of those is persisted queries. So with an application that you control, those queries are not going to be, uh, queries that are sent from clients are not going to be arbitrary. You know at build time what the queries are uh, that are going to be created. You can extract those from your code. And the code that runs in production, instead of sending the entire query, you can just send a reference to a query um, that's saved. It could be on disk, it could be in a database, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it's going to send a reference to it, maybe it's a hashed reference, maybe it's, a, um, maybe it's just a, uh, an ID. Uh, but essentially what these are um, is you're, you're creating uh, just a, a list of, a subset of, of queries that can be made. And so you know at build time in production all of the possible queries that can be made against your server. And so this allows you to address some of the security and performance concerns. You could potentially test some of, uh, test some of these in isolation, run sort of integration tests. Um, but it, it reduces some of the surface area um, that, that could present uh, problems uh, running that otherwise you would have if arbitrary queries could be run against your server. Um, and finally, uh, I want to just briefly touch on uh, what I think is a really exciting feature of GraphQL. Um, but unfortunately one that doesn't have support um, in PHP, and that's subscriptions. Uh, so subscriptions allow you to uh, make a query, but instead of uh, a query, you're using that subscription type. And you can actually, uh, you're basically requesting uh, for data whenever an event happens. So let's imagine you could vote on conference talks, um, for example. Um, so if you wanted to subscribe to those votes, uh, whenever a, a vote event occurs, uh, GraphQL could send you, could push to your client the uh, data about that particular, uh, that particular vote. Um, usually this happens over a long-lived WebSocket connection, which I think is a little bit of the reason why we don't have uh, support built into GraphQL PHP for it. Um, certainly it's, it's not impossible, it's just not currently supported in, uh, in those libraries. And if this is the key feature of GraphQL that you're interested in, uh, potentially you, you might want to look at another server implementation for your GraphQL server. Maybe that's Node, uh, for example, um, that could have built-in support uh, for subscriptions. This is an interesting feature uh, that could be useful in, in certain types of applications. Um, applications that rely on live data that you want to be um, updated. Maybe you're writing an email application or a chat application or something that is going to get um, events that it, that it wants immediately. And the nice thing is you can use these subscriptions in your existing uh, GraphQL client library. Um, you can use them just like queries because essentially the query is formatted in the same exact way. Whenever we think about a new technology, um, I think it's only fair to talk about some of the drawbacks or some of the challenges that, that arise with it. And I'm not gonna say that GraphQL is the right, the right tool for every job. It's the right tool for, for some applications. And it's a new paradigm. It's a new paradigm that unlocks a lot of opportunities uh, for developing APIs, especially ones that are performance sensitive, that are latency sensitive. Um, but it, it comes with new challenges. So I want to address some of these. Um, but I actually recommend um, uh, this talk um, by Robert Zhu, um, the, the case against GraphQL. Um, he's actually, he, uh, Robert has worked on GraphQL quite a bit. Um, so I, I think in general he's a He's a strong proponent of GraphQL, but he, he gives a, an excellent talk, I think, on some of the challenges or some of the drawbacks and how to think about them. Uh, so uh, some that I just wanted to call out, um, is it certainly more complex than RESTful APIs? I think that's pretty clear as soon as you start diving into GraphQL. If you're working with an ORM, a lot of ORMs are not yet ready to work performantly with GraphQL to handle those N plus one uh, problems that I mentioned earlier. You can certainly write those yourself, and so if you're if you're writing that data access layer yourself, you might not have a problem. Um, but if you're working with an out-of-the-box ORM, it might not have uh, good support um, uh, for that. I'd say yet there are some tools that are looking to, uh, to change this. Um, caching is a lot more challenging, uh, especially client-side. I mentioned Apollo, um, and Apollo exists, I think, because one of the, one of the big features is handling that client-side caching. Um, unlike something like a RESTful API where you you're just, say, requesting a set of one resource and you get back that in that same request and you can store that in a client-side cache. Uh, with GraphQL, that data might be nested, right? Those types might be nested uh, in multiple different 
multiple different fields. And if you want to be able to efficiently cache that so you're not making those same queries over and over again, uh, you, need, you need a rich library to, to handle that for you. Um, Apollo does that really well, uh, but you're not going to get that. Uh, you don't get that just out of the box with a, uh, a plain query against a, a server. Um, application metrics are a lot more complicated. Um, right? Instead of looking at, um, if, you if you have a poorly performing endpoint in a RESTful API, that's pretty clear what that endpoint is. Um, but if you have a poorly performing field, you're going to need to do a little bit more work to, to instrument that to provide uh, the right metrics for what might be a performance issue, for example, in a uh, GraphQL application. Um, and again, there are, there are APM tools that, uh, that do a good job at, at supporting this now. Um, and as GraphQL becomes more mature and more popular, we're going to see more and more uh, tools and services that support it. Um, but that is definitely something that's more complex. GraphQL might not always be the best choice for your API. Um, as with anything, consider your use cases, the problems you're trying to solve, weigh the trade-offs, and make a decision. Um, I think it's another tool uh, in your toolbox, and it's, it's useful to, to think about um, when we're thinking about how we structure our data and how we structure our APIs. GraphQL makes it easier to make more efficient queries between client and server. But more importantly, it provides new ways to think about your API, new ways to think about how you're structuring your application's data. I recommend giving it a try. Um, it's, it's fun to work with. Um, and get an understanding for, for what the trade-offs are and, and how it might be able to solve some of the problems uh, that you're facing. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is the link to the tutorial that I gave yesterday. Um, there are a bunch of exercises there that you can go through, um, basically building up the API that I, I talked a little bit about uh, just now. Um, it's on GitHub, and there's a glitch. Uh, there's a glitch URL, so you don't even need to run it locally. You can run it um, in a VM that you can spin up. Now we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, so the question was, uh, when you write, when you design your database, uh, you're thinking about what queries are going to be run against it. And with GraphQL, those might be um, a little less predictable, or they might be, it might be a little bit different than, than what you're designing your, your database for. Is that a performance risk? Is that a challenge? Um, I think it is. Um, it's definitely a challenge. One thing, though, to keep in mind is that GraphQL doesn't magically expose your entire database and like any query under the sun to being accessed. Um, those data source. Uh, 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 functions, those methods that I uh, mentioned, those, um, in the tutorial um, actually uh, uses a, a database under the hood there uh, to demonstrate how that can work. Um, you can write what queries um, are going to be made so you know what queries can be made. Now, you, they might not be run in the same way that uh, they are if you have more strict, if you have a strict kind of REST um, endpoint. Um, I think you have similar challenges with an ORM. Um, and, and so you're probably going to face similar challenges with GraphQL. Um, there, are certainly, there are certainly approaches that you can take to, uh, to mitigate that, and you might need to think about how those, uh, how those uh, data access layers are being kind of built. Um, you, you definitely run into similar issues. Maybe you're not hitting a database at all. Maybe you're hitting other services. Um, you're going to have other challenges there. Um, Oftentimes, we just want to think about the number of queries we're making and, and how costly those might be and, and reducing that risk. But I think that's something um, important to consider. Yep. Yes, yeah, so, uh, most GraphQL um, patterns or recommendations um, are not opinionated about where that needs to live, but they generally say it shouldn't be in, in your resolver. Um, that it would usually be in a model layer or a business layer behind your resolver. So instead of that resolver going right to a database, instead of inlining a query there, it might have you know a, a method that's um, you know to give me access to or, or uh, send me back the conferences that I need, um, and I can say send me back you know, for this user. Right, I know what this user can see, um, and then that can be passed through. That that's the authentication piece and who the user is, and then what the user has access to can be handled at a different layer. Because GraphQL might not be the only way you're accessing that data, and so you don't want your authorization in just your API side, right? So that, that's, I think, some of the theory about not putting that just in, in GraphQL. Yep. Yeah, I'm not, 
I'm not super familiar with where where it is on the symphony side, um, so I, I I wouldn't be able to give a, a great answer to that right now. Um, I do know that the uh, the uh, WebOnix GraphQL PHP library um, is used by a few different uh, symphony components for supporting GraphQL. It's also used by um, so WebOnix GraphQL PHP is kind of the lowest level GraphQL PHP library you might be using, and then there are a few different libraries that build on top of that. Um, so it might be worth checking out uh, what those libraries do to integrate more closely with frameworks like Laravel or Symfony. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, are there any best practices for um, architecting uh, your entire application in PHP with the GraphQL API? Um, one, I think it might depend on the framework that you're using, so I don't want to go into too many details there. I think generically you can think of a GraphQL endpoint as a controller. Um, and probably the resolvers would fit into that category as well. It definitely breaks the mold a little bit, right? Um, but um, I don't think it's that much different from where your like RESTful endpoints would be. And then you would still delegate to your service layer, to your to your model layer, to your, like to your data access layer. So that that would that wouldn't be that much different. Um, it would just be another way of accessing that. And it might be that your application has both a GraphQL and a RESTful API. Um, a lot of the the third party services that I mentioned, things like get the GitHub API, I believe they have both a RESTful and a, a GraphQL API. Um, which might make sense if you're working with multiple clients. Um, and so I could see that um, those kind of sitting side by side. Um, yeah, the difference is you wouldn't have multiple endpoints with GraphQL. You tend to have one. Cool. I think we're out of time. Thanks, everyone.